Klaus Schariot, welcome back to the Institute. Um, Great to be back here. You have been a part of this uh, AICGS family for many years, and it's always good to have you back here. But you're coming at a time, uh, I think, when um, not only is there trouble across the Atlantic in certain ways, uh, dealing with Russia in particularly, but also dealing with Iran. And one of the good things about you, Klaus, is that you also know the domestic roots of American foreign policy as well as your own. And that sometimes is very difficult to translate, something we do here a lot at the Institute. But let's start with a, with a juggernaut, and that is the Russia problem. Um, clearly, there is, you saw the Munich Security Conference where we were both in attendance, how the Americans responded to Mrs. Merkel when she gave her speech, and there was a, a good deal of pushback on the part of some senators, like Senator Corker and a few others, saying we've got to give them more support, and uh, Frau Merkel saying, I'm not sure that military support is going to solve this problem. Do you see more of that tension building up? And not to forget that we have an election year coming up next year, but do you see more of that tension that you saw in Munich between McCain and between Corker and to some extent Lindsey Graham? Uh, do you see more of that happening in the future, or are we going to try to figure out how to deal with a problem which is almost a bottomless pit called Ukraine? Before I come to that, Jack, let me just say how great it is to be back at the AICGS. I followed the work of you and the Institute for many years, yeah. and I must say tremendous work. Thank you very much. Now, to Russia. Huge huge problem. I really, to answer your question, I believe that it's absolutely key that Europe and America stay very closely together here, and because that's the only chance how we can convince uh, Putin that we are serious about defending the pan-European peace order, and that's what it's all about. And I was not so happy about some senators in Munich, but I do think you have to make a difference between what they said and what Vice President Biden and what uh, Secretary of State Kerry said. They were basically almost exactly on the line of the Europeans, of uh, Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande, and they, I think, are ready to give the Minsk process a chance, and I think that is the thing to do. And I believe that the senators were slightly off well, I think that the problem that I see here is that um, there is a sense in certain circles in town, you know them personally, where they'll say, Minsk. There's almost a kind of a throwaway phrase, Klaus, which your English is so good you'll understand. If we keep doing Minsk, we'll make mincemeat out of Ukraine. <laughs> how, how do we deal with the current problem of hybrid warfare with Putin basically on the winning side at the moment? I think the key consideration here is to think things from the end. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I learned in 35 years of foreign policy. When you pick a fight, pick it there where you are strong. Mm -hmm. And I think in as far as weapon delivery is concerned, I think it is Putin who has the escalation dominance, as we say in the old sure. professional language. I mean, he can deliver arms within hours, actually he has done so, and he could continue to do so within hours across the border, whereas for us it would always take weeks. That's the first consideration. The second consideration is I think one should be very careful about sending advisors, uh, foreign advisors there, because Putin would love to grab one or two of those and just show them to the world here we have proof now this is not the Ukrainian government, this is foreign powers, this is the United States. Mm. So I believe we should uh, put the emphasis on those areas where we have a good hand, where we are strong. And they are? And they are finance uh -huh. and trade. Oh, this is not so much uh, the case for the United States. Your trade with, your, with Russia is relatively negligible. But for instance, a country like Germany has a lot of trade, and we have a lot of companies there. Mm -hmm. And if Germany and other European countries do serious trade sanctions, as we have them right now, I think that hurts. It hurts not in the very short run, but it hurts in the medium 
uh, run and also in the long run. But the problem with that analysis and the view of some people here, some hardliners, is that in the long run we'll all be dead, as, Main, as Maynard Keith said. In other words, how much time do we have to maintain a Ukraine that's viable? Admittedly, the Donetsk and that western, eastern part is only 7% of the country. But there's still, and let's come back to that, you said the European pan and European peace order, Putin violated that. He, with violence and premeditated, went in and changed a border that hasn't happened since, well, you know when. I, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, first of all, I very much agree with you, Jack, when you said that uh, Putin violated the peace order. Yeah. And I, I let me stress, it is, was jointly erected. It was not a Western peace order. It was a peace order jointly erected by Soviet Union, Russia, and the West. It began with the Helsinki Final Act in 75, a Soviet idea, mm -hmm. but then picked up by the West and changed a little bit. It continued uh, via the Charter of Paris. It, uh, I think, very important was the Budapest Memorandum of 1994, when uh, United States, Russia, and uh, Britain guaranteed the territorial integrity of Ukraine in exchange. if they would in exchange right. for giving up nuclear weapons. Right. And also the NATO-Russia uh, uh, founding act, I think, mm -hmm. was done together. I was there, and it was done together with the Russians. It mm -hmm. was not done against the Russians. Actually, I was in a conversation with Yeltsin, who liked the idea. So I think we have to really uh, be very serious that the real challenge is that Putin seems to be abandoning these, right. this peace order, which they, the Russians, constructed together with us. Now, do we have a short-term solution? I think that's very difficult. I, uh, I would like to say, even if we would deliver arms now, that would not be a short-term solution. Mm -hmm. I think the short th in the short run, uh, Putin being much closer there has always the upper hand. Right. But I think politics is always something about strategic patience. Mm -hmm. And when you, for instance, in 1946, 1947, invented the theory of containment, that, of course, was working in the long run or the medium run. It mm -hmm. did not work immediately. And I think we have to go for the medium and long run mm -hmm. to really make Putin, if he continues to do that, pay a price. And that could be in trade. It could be in finances. But it's also in appreciation of Russia in the public opinion. For the first time since polls are taken in Ukraine, a vast majority of the Ukrainians, 75%, that's what I heard, are afraid of Russia. Mm -hmm. That has never been the case. Mm -hmm. You see, they were very close. Right. And Putin is about to lose people who normally would always support Russia. Well, I think that's true. It's interesting as well that the fears that you talked about in Ukraine are contagious because they're also up in the Baltics, they're in Poland, in other words, all along that line. Um, the question, I guess, is going to be, uh, will we have the strategic patience and will Putin uh, And how will that work? We better have strategic patience because I think it is absolutely key in foreign policy that you, go f that you do not go for your first instincts to do something, to make you feel better. It's not about feeling better. I think many of the people who argue for arms delivery, they say, I oh, feel better. For instance, one of the senators, when asked in Munich, Senator Graham, to be exact. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Lindsey Graham. Yeah, yeah. He said, when asked, now, I don't really know in Munich, you were there. I don't really know if it will work, but it will it make me feel much better. Obviously, the, the European Army is a very old idea. It's been around for a while. Um, when it was raised, I think a lot of people thought here, well, we've heard that story before. Do you think this has traction? I think, first, we will have to rely on NATO. Yeah. I think the European army is something a little bit further away on mm -hmm. the horizon. I wouldn't give it up. Actually, there is a paper, there was a joint paper in the early years of this century, a French-German paper, which argued for it. Uh, at the time, we, of course, knew, uh, knew that 
prints for the bits, it would have been a problem at the time, and it has not become easier for them. Mm -hmm. And I think something like that should be all-inclusive. It mm -hmm. should have practically all the European countries on board. And so we have to see and have to wait until public opinion in the UK begins to evolve in this direction. For the time being, I think we have to do more at NATO. And you see, for instance, that we uh, created this force, uh, this uh, high readiness force. This very rapid response rapid force. Rapid response yeah. force, mm. and that you see, and it's interesting to see mm. that in basically all the things which were created newly in Wales, Germany is taking a lead. Mm -hmm. And that is also interesting, because I think Putin helps uh, to, let's say, uh, helps the German public opinion to evo evolve. And to issue. maybe be more accepting of something like exactly. that. You and I were both, I think, in Munich together in 2007 when Mr. Putin gave that speech. And I remember the then uh, Czech uh, Foreign Minister Schwarzenberg yes. saying, thank you, now we know why we need NATO. <laughs> In no, other that's words, it, it's I, exactly right. Yeah. And I, I, I just reread that speech again. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating to see how many elements of this most current speech given at the Valdai Club in October of last year are already in there in 2007. And maybe we could say that we didn't take all of it seriously enough. Maybe we could say that. But I, I still remember, we were talking about it. We were exactly talking about the speech immediately afterwards. And I remember that we both had the feeling this is to be taken very seriously. I think so. The only proviso I would add here is that, you know, we have, as you well know, you, you were here for those critical years, uh, the domestic foreign policy situation in the United States is very, very important for foreign policy as it is in Germany. Um, and I think that this issue of dealing with Russia, or for that matter, Iran and a few other boiling boiling uh, fires out there um, are often um, the result of the discussions that go on between the White House and the Congress, not just with Germany and not just with our NATO allies. I hope that we can find through this challenge that we have through both Russia as well as through Ukraine and on and ISIS and so many others, that we still remember in the name of what we are together. And I think sometimes that gets kind of covered up with the domestic political uh, problems that we have on both sides of our ocean. Maybe it's in Europe easier to see. We very much know that if we want to make progress, for instance on Iran, we can only do it together with the United States. As you will remember, Germany together with France and Britain started that process in 2003 and we made some progress, but to really get to a result, we need the United States. Right. And I'm very confident that we have now for the first time in those 12 years, a real chance to get an agreement. I'm not particularly happy about a letter uh, oh. written by 47 senators. I think it is a bad precedent for foreign policy. I think we had uh, always in the past the theory that foreign policy should be led by the government, led by the president, led by uh, people in power. And that treaties, of course, have to be ratified by Congress or by Parliament. But it's not the legislature which is leading. You can uh, reread in the discussion leading up to the American Constitution in 1789 that that doesn't work. Because in the 1776 document, you didn't have the strong hand for the president. And there was a purpose in creating it. So I really believe we should be on the right track. I'm so glad that a German ambassador is reminding me to go read back 1789 <laughs> constitutional <laughs> law. Klaus, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you for coming. Pleasure was mine. Thank you very much.